as you know, as Bitcoin's gone through more and more of these cycles, uh, and as I've learned more about it. Uh, so I covered it in 2017, and back then we had kind of competing narratives of store value versus medium of payment. Uh, we also had, you know, the, the forks, like, so we had Bitcoin Cash, we had, you know, the rise of that alt season. And so I was, I was concerned about dilution. I was like, you know, even if money pours into the space, what if it gets diluted in a bunch of these other tokens? Uh, but that's largely been settled over the past several years. The market's kind of strongly chosen Bitcoin as kind of its major store value token. And some of these other protocols might, you know, they might solve individual problems, uh, might disrupt other industries. But Bitcoin's really centralized. It's network effect around the role of being money. Uh, and so I turned quite bullish on it in April of this year, uh, both in the, in the intermediate term, uh, in terms of, you know, where it is in the halving cycle. Uh, and so kind of you know, looking out, say two years from that point and saying, I think this is likely to do well uh, in price terms. And then longer term, it's just, it, it's done extraordinarily well. I mean, it, it's rise, I, I described it as like algorithmic. Like if you look at this, if it's price pattern in log form, especially if you put the halving points on there, it looks like a machine just kind of slowly increasing, you know, quickly increasing its market cap. But on that log chart, it's like this, this steady kind of heartbeat going up over time, you know, every four years. Uh, and so I think it's gonna be interesting to see how that, how high that tops out, right? So of course you have, you have one camp that thinks that that's gonna go all the way, hyper Bitcoinization, we're all gonna be paying in sats. On the other hand, you have kind of the, the next step lower than that is, I think that like Michael Saylor falls in this group where he, just, he views it as a, 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 a bank and cyber state space, right? So instead of kind of taking over, it's just this, this increasingly growing uh, market share uh, that anyone with an internet connection can access and store value in in a scarce asset. And so I, I'm primarily viewing it at that level where, you know, as something with maybe 350 billion market cap as of this discussion, uh, it has a lot of kind of a, a addressable market uh, just to even just to be a digital gold, just as a digital store of value that they can't be debased. I mean, that alone is a, is a potential multi trillion dollar market cap. Uh, and then, you know, going from there, you know, we've seen, for example, uh, Iran has, has played with it a little bit for, uh, you know, as a store of value or going around sanctions. So as a medium of, of exchange, and I think if it, if it gets big enough, you could see other of those smaller central banks start to dabble in it as well. And so I'm, I'm pretty bullish on it, uh, both for retail investors and uh, Wall Street money. And then, you know, we'll see how it goes. It could be some state state money coming into it. Yeah. And one of the things I keep thinking about is, and you talked about the petrodollar, is, you know, is there a world where we basically see uh, some Middle Eastern country, let's say, go ahead, uh, put a bunch of it in their reserves and then start to attempt to uh, price goods and services in Bitcoin? Right. And, and uh, that to me feels like that is a low probability of happening, uh, but would have a maximum impact on both the price of Bitcoin adoption, uh, et cetera. It would kind of force the hands of central banks around the world to, to go ahead and adopt this. Any thoughts in terms of uh, geopolitically how this could play out in terms of if one of those central banks does go ahead and adopt it? Obviously, there's a difference between it being an Iran, a Venezuela, a North Korea type versus, uh, let's say, a Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, or even the United States. But just how do you think about uh, kind of that geopolitical sequencing and, and any of the game theory behind it? So I think it's it's there's some degree of probability for some of those more renegade nations. Uh, but the thing there is that instead of saying we're going to adopt this uh, and you're going to pay for it like that, uh, a lot of them are kind of at the whims of their customers. Uh, so Iran wants to do business with India. They want to do business with Europe. And those countries generally want to do business with Iran uh, because they're both, you know, they're, those areas are big oil importers. Iran has the oil. And so they, they've generally had constructive trade, uh, you know, processes in the past. Uh, and so many of them want to do business with Iran, but uh, they had troubles with U.S. sanctions. Uh, same with China as well. They also want to buy Iranian oil and they also invest in Iran. And so Europe created uh, Instex, like it's their, it's their uh, kind of alternative to the SWIFT. So it's, it's basically paying for things outside of the dollar system, uh, outside of, of, you know, that that they can go around the sanctions. Now they tested it with Iran earlier this year, but then they, they stopped using it. And I don't know if it's because they had, you know, behind the scenes, you know, pressure or it just wasn't working. I'm not sure what the, what the reasons for that was, but it was kind of an idea that just hasn't really kind of taken off. And then of course we had the news about Bitcoin, uh, Iran going into Bitcoin a little bit, using some of their miners to, uh, you know, uh, you know, buy Bitcoin, they can buy Bitcoin directly from the ones they generate and potentially use those for trade and whatever mechanisms that uh, some of its, uh, you know, oil importer 
uh, you know, neighbors or uh, trade partners would, would be willing to use. So I don't think Iran's in a position to like dictate terms, uh, but I think all of these, anything that, that is basically outside the dollar system is something that they'd be willing to explore. Uh, now, in terms of like Saudi Arabia pricing oil in it, I don't think that's very likely uh, in, in, you know, in the near term, uh, just because, you know, there's still a couple steps. So for example, they have an agreement to only price it in dollars. So I, I think before you'd see them price it in something like Bitcoin, they could price it in yuan. Uh, because for example, China is their biggest customer now, uh, and China has an interest in being able to pay it their own currency. And so and so if, if Saudi Arabia prices it in, in China's currency, they can then use that to buy some of the tech that, that China is able to sell. And so we've seen that to a limited extent between say, you know, China and Russia, and so I do think that that would be kind of a more likely outcome. That you'd see maybe more euro-based pricing or more, you know, a little bit of China currency pricing in some of those energy markets before you would see, uh, you know, uh, a Bitcoin pricing. You know, because my research service were able to uh, buy individual stocks rather than just uh, indices. Uh, so I do a lot of work on individual companies, and so I have a basket of kind of dividend growth stocks that are, you know, kind of uh, like medium cap or large cap blue chip but also you know they're not the kind of the old stodgy ones that aren't growing they're also growing and paying dividends and they're they're highly relevant uh, then on the other hand i have a basket of growth stocks and so you know that's that's you know it previously included stocks like adobe and nvidia i've rotated that a little bit including into MicroStrategy uh back in august uh when they when they announced they were going on the bitcoin standard i, I put a little bit of that in the growth section of the portfolio uh, i also have a commodity section uh, which, which for me, mostly includes commodity producers uh, or, or transporters. So uh, energy pipe, pipelines, some of the energy producers, some of the copper producers, uh, some of the uranium producers. I also have some allocations to uh, gold and silver uh, directly uh, and uh, increasingly platinum. Also, I, I've been uh, recently bullish on platinum. That's been my, one of my uh, rotations a little bit is a little bit of gold into platinum. Uh, and I'm also uh, pretty bullish on emerging markets, uh, but I, I I separate those, you know, so I, I use some of the broader indices. I also buy some individual stocks from emerging markets, uh, and I also use either regional ETFs or single country ETFs uh, so that I can kind of sculpt that in, into areas where I'm bullish on. Because if you look at a, a normal emerging markets ETF, it's heavily concentrated in China, uh, which some investors may prefer, whereas other investors might not want like 40% of their emerging markets uh, exposure to be uh, in one country. Uh, especially China. And so, you know, I, you can buy like say a, uh, an India single country ETF or a, a closed end fund that actively invests in India uh, or, you know, things like that. So I, I do some targeted emerging market exposure. Uh, I'm underweight to some extent uh, for developed markets, uh, but not, not like majorly underweight. I just think that emerging markets are a little bit more attractive. Uh, but I do, as I mentioned, like some individual European stocks, individual Japanese stocks. Uh, and then for U.S. stocks, uh, I've generally, you know, focused more on that intersection between quality and value. So companies that are either growth at a reasonable price or that, you know, are bombed out this year, but then are recovering and that their business model is still suitable for the next 10 years or so. And so that and then, of course, I also have a, a digital asset. I, I have Bitcoin uh, in many of my portfolios as well. And so that's that's one thing I'm probably bullish on the most uh, specifically for 2021. Uh, but, you know, because the volatility of it, you have to manage the position sizing.